How am I supposed to talk after that, Yoon? I don't know if you could hear that, but, but Yoon shared with me that back in 2013, she lost her sister to cancer. And it was this song that she got to sing that got her through. And said, uh, the gift that we received this morning, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. All right, David, collect yourself. We're going to continue on in Romans 8. 
for just a few verses. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew also He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Friends, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Thanks be to God. Let's, let's pray together. Loving God, open our eyes and open our ears that we might clearly see and clearly hear what you would have us learn from your word. Lord, most of all, open our hearts and make yourself a home. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I read earlier this week, that we live in a world that is all about red dots. Now, what in the world does that mean? If you're ever on Facebook and you post something that you want your friends to read and you look for the red dot to see if anybody liked what you said so that you're thinking along the same lines. I know this as a photographer. I, I share photos on my Facebook page all the time. And it's so, it's so often because I just see something I love. Maybe it's grandkids. And, and there's something to the fact that you go to it and you look for a red dot for someone to say, yeah, yeah, me too. I see what you're seeing. I love it too. And so the, the article that I read talked a lot about we seek some sort of satisfaction when we seek that. We seek some kind of glorification at times because it can become a bit addictive. It isn't just the, hey, others think the way I do or believe in the same things I do. But they like what I think. And that's sort of a glorification. I think that we need to get straightened out in our heads what it means when it comes to being glorified. I often think if there is a God, and I believe there is, and if he rules the world in his sovereignty as the Bible says that he does, and if he, he will bring human history to a close according to his plan, like the Bible says that he will, and appoint to every person his eternal destiny as Jesus taught he will, then two very important questions for humanity must be answered. And they're these. What is God's goal in creating and governing the world? What's the point? The second is, how can I bring my life into a line with that goal? Now, you may not realize it, but I believe each and every one of you has asked yourself those two questions. Or you wouldn't be here. There's other things to do in Florida on a beautiful morning that's not raining, which is very rare this time of year. What does God do in creating the world? You believe that there's a God that created the world. I only know that, or you might be elsewhere. And how can... How can my life align with what God is teaching me? That's seeking God's will. Seeking the knowledge and the understanding of what's this all about, God? And I think those are really healthy things. Those are really healthy for us to try to understand. It's a fearful thing to be at a cross current with that. To think that there is no purpose. There is no meaning. There is no alignment with anything. I can't understand how to live my life that way. I may have before. I may have at times. We all have probably. But I can't understand that being a decision, a life-altering decision. 
So to understand a little bit about this, why am I here on Sunday morning? What can I do to align with God? Is me asking my question, why did I leave my career in, in banking, in investments, to become a pastor? Why did I decide that I am giving everything I've got to this God whom I can't see? We read about that earlier. Hope is understanding something and believing in something that you can't see. Because why would you hope for something that you've already seen? So my first thought in looking at this is, is why did God create a group or a being to follow him? And I look at Israel. Israel is God's beloved group. What God, what's his goal in creating for the world, especially for those? I read, read the text earlier from Isaiah 43. It describes the purpose of why Israel was created. For the, so the last couple of verses in that, fear not for I am with you. I will bring your offspring for the east and the west. I will gather all of you, everybody, no one's excluded. Everyone who is called by my name, who I created for glory. God created Israel for glory. God didn't create Israel or followers of him to go and seek glory in themselves. God called them by name. God called them out from the east, from the west, formed them, made them for glory. And that's what we're going to look at. The purpose of why we were made, why we were brought. The main point of this passage is to encourage people not to fear what man or nature can do to them or what they can't find in man or nature, but what God has created us to be. And that's glorified. In this text, we know that God is and who he was and why he created us. In verse 4, it says, you are my precious. You are precious in my eyes. I love you. Three of the strongest words we've ever been taught in our lives. I love you. I'm willing to give everything for you. I want you to be glorified in your relationship with me. We need to understand this context. I have three kids, two grandkids. It's kind of fun to say I haven't said that before. They're precious to me. I love them to death. But they were not made precious to me. And I didn't love them in 1980. They weren't created yet. They weren't around yet. They didn't exist. They had not been planned. What would I have been, 18? Uh, no, there was no plan. So the deeper question is, what does this mean? God is saying here in Isaiah, I, I love you. I love the creation. He hasn't even created us all yet. But that separates the love that God has for us than the love that you express for another. Why was Israel created? Why were they conceived? Why did God bring into existence a people who... He could regard as precious? What was his motive? Verse 7. God created Israel for glory. God's goal from the beginning, ever since Adam and Eve had been chosen, uh, they, they said, or God said, don't eat the forbidden fruit. Don't, don't go near that. And I'm not going to try and get uh, an exact quote with that. Stay away from that. Of course they didn't. Snake comes along, speaks through the woman, Adam does nothing, and they eat the forbidden fruit. Sin is introduced to the world. That's the beginning of the rebellion. That's the beginning of mankind's rebellion. But instead of God abandoning us, instead of God saying, ah, they won't listen, let's, let's wipe, let's use the eraser, let's start over. God starts a new thing in Genesis 12. He takes a guy named Abram, who there's no way he's going to have kids. He's older than anybody in this room. There's no way he's going to have kids. And he says, your offspring are going to be numerous, more than the stars in the sky. I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. 
if Abram were to understand what God was saying to him at that time, he would have said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. My wife is barren. This can't happen. But that's our way of thinking, isn't it? That's our way of understanding things. God says, I've got an idea that's going to make your socks roll up and down. Now, let's assume he wore socks with his sandals. I know it's a Florida thing. You're going to, your offspring is going to be amazing. Bigger than you can even think. And you're going to bless, I'm going to bless all nations through you. God is glorified through that. Does he say the same thing to you and I? Hear yourself in this text. Man was created from its beginning. Made in the image of God. That that image might bring forth God's glory. Man was to multiply and fill the earth so that the knowledge and the glory of God would cover the earth. Ever since the fall of man, uh, man has been in rebellious of this, but God has continued to love beyond what we can imagine, beyond the way that we would. We were created for God's glory. Now, what does that mean for this glory? Glory is a very hard thing to define. It's like the word beauty. How do you define beauty? You describe it using a picture of someone or, or a picture of something. It's hard to describe this. I, I started shooting photography, trying to see the beautiful in the ordinary, the extraordinary in the ordinary, trying to find my way through a very difficult period in my life and seeing things differently through the lens of a camera. I'm looking at my friend Chris, wondering how he started. But glory, we can all use it to communicate with or, or to, to reduce it to words, but it's easier for examples. I was going to show you some, but I decided not to. A sunset scene from the Gulf Coast through the legs of a pier that's on the beach. That's glory. A perfect performance on the balance beam by a Nadia Comaneci or someone along those lines. Well, that's glory. It's beauty. How about a kid jumping off a bus filled with life? After the first day of kindergarten. Oh, to have such energy, right? Well, that's glory. The glory of God is the beauty and excellence of its manifold perfections. It's an attempt to put into words what God is like. We can't put that into words. The term might focus on the different attributes from time to time, like his power, his wisdom, his mercy, justice, just because one is awesome and beautiful and it's magnified in quality, but, but glory somehow encompasses all of those at the same time. All that God is about, all the love that we can't seem to understand because we don't forgive the same way God does. We don't love the same way God does. We don't seek the well-being of all of humanity the same way that God does. But somehow or other, all of this gorgeous, beautiful, incredibly impossible to describe manifold system is described in glory. God made us to be His glory. How are we doing? If you watch the news, not so good, huh? God's glory is the perfect harmony of all the best attributes we can possibly imagine. And he wants to glorify us. The best that we can imagine. A staggering but necessary thought that God has always existed. God doesn't create us so that he might be glorified more God creates us that he may be glorified through. Keep that in mind. We don't bring extra to God. He brings it to us. That's what it means to be God. It should humble us. It should make us bow down and worship and sing, it is well with my soul. Yet, 
we find ourselves glory seeking. We find ourselves sensation seeking. We're not the brightest bulbs in the strand, are we? Glory seeking is also can be thought of as sensation seeking. It's a tendency to pursue some kind of sensory pleasure or excitement. That's why I began describing Facebook. It's the trait of people who go after novelty, complexity, intense sensations, who love experience for its own sake, who take risks in the pursuit of the experience itself, who seek glory, maybe apart from God. Not always. I'm not trying to say that. Glory seekers, are, seekers I've read, are easily bored without high levels of stimulation. Sam Gosling, a psychologist, wrote this. He said, they love bright lights and hustle and bustle and like to take risks and seek thrills for that reason only. Sensation seekers, he goes on, are motivi- motivated by the immediate gratification sensory experiences can provide. So they may disregard the dangers that accompany some risky behaviors such as gambling, drugs, reckless driving, and so on. Despite the hazards of certain behaviors, risk-taking has values and serves important evolutionary purpose. He goes on to try and help us understand that that risky behaviors are an okay thing. But when we engage in sensation-seeking, when the sensation is over, the only thing left to do is to seek again. And again. And again. This is seeking glory apart from God. Seeking glory in God isn't who we are. We're seeking to be with God. It's God that does the glorifying. It's God that does the feelings of good around you when that happens. You know what it's like when you help out a friend who isn't feeling well. You feel good about the moment. That's about God's glory pouring through you, working through you. I read a story about an Olympic athlete to give you an idea that we'll go to amazing lengths to seek glory. He was an American shot shot putter, 2004 Athens Olympics. He worked hard, tirelessly. The guy's name was Adam Nelson. And he, by a narrow margin got the silver medal. Now, as the story goes, that 10 years after that, 2014 or so, they did a special test. I don't know what they did different, but did a special test and realized that the winner had been doping. Steroids. And so they stripped the guy of his gold medal, and this Adam Nelson, he got the gold medal 10 years later. They asked the question, how did it feel to finally receive the gold? And he said, well, initially it was bittersweet. The moment has passed, but you appreciate getting recognition for the hard work that you put in. Afterward, when you start thinking about the opportunities that you lost, it's a really different experience than I think most people would understand. But I've had to come to terms with the financial losses uh, between the two medals. But losing the memory, losing the experience will always bother me. They ask him also, what do you think motivates athletes to dope or to use performance-enhancing drugs? He says, I remember people telling me it's impossible to compete at this level and stay clean. It's a tempting trap for people to fall into. Then they ask him how he felt about the gold medalist that had cheated. He says, I can't say I have a lot of love for him, but I understand where he's coming from. He grew up in a system where you wake up and you take your Flintstone vitamins with a dose of, and I can't even pronounce it, performance enhancing drug, steroid. And that's just the norm. In some cultures, athletes are promised glory for their families and futures if they do well. We live in a system where it's that do for me now. What can, I, what can I accomplish now? What can I go in the short term now? And that's maybe what this does, this glory seeking, this i got to be the best now. Scripture doesn't teach us that it works like that. Verse 30 that we have on our screen is very straight up. Those whom he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. 
This is a systematic thinking of how this works. This is a system being that one plus one plus one equals glorified, in a sense. Predestined. What does it mean to pre- be predestined? We're in a Presbyterian church. I think we invented predestined. It means some people are called according to God's purpose. God is going to call. They are destined to be with God. When I was ordained, they asked me how I felt about this. And I said I had a problem with it. Because it assumes then what is called double predestination. Meaning, if you assume that someone is predestined to be with God, that also assumes that some are not. I have a hard time understanding that. I have a hard time accepting that. But this predestination tells us an awful lot about the character. I believe in predestination through the Son. We can talk about that later if you want to. But it tells us a lot about the character of God. God is meticulously writing the story of history according to his own prescript. This is what I understand predestination to teach us. Though we speak of accidents, really there are no accidents. Nothing will take place today that wasn't carefully planned. God has been here. God is with us now. God goes before us. That's really the ultimate idea of predestination. God loves sinners. Go figure. We should never get over that stunning reality. God loves sinners. Though we've rebelled against him, God sent his only son to die in the place of sinners with his son who was never guilty of any of it. God also uses means to achieve his ends. He uses us. And God's glory is ultimate, not man's. Predestination always says something important about us apart from the unilateral work of grace. We cannot please God. But then it also says that we're called. We are called. This is a, a word that is used a lot in the Presbyterian church. I've been called to my position as a pastor. Officers of our church, we all met yesterday, have been called to their position. Romans 8 is interesting in that it uses the idea of glorified in a past tense. All of this is a past tense tense. When we think about glorified all too often, we think about the idea of it being a future event, but it says first you've been called. This describes to us what happens when all of this has happened for the person. Paul means that we have been called or justified, and therefore we will end up being glorified. There are three different kinds of calls that I just want you to to walk away with. There's a general call. God gives that to all creatures on earth. Come to me, and then you choose. There's the effectual call. Many Christians, such as myself, are being uh, called as pastors, called as officers. There's an effect of what happens when we're called. Then there's the technical call, and it's related to one's work. The Lord bids each one of us life's actions to look the calling. But then there's justified. So, being predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified. Justified is a term that I learned way back in in, uh, Sunday school a long time ago, justified just as if I'd. It's forgiveness. Just as if I'd never done it in the first place. Is how you can think of justified. Justification is an area of significance which separates many religious practices. We believe that the Lord sent His Son so that we may be justified, forgiven of our sin, that it has separated us for so long that we might then be glorified. Scriptures um, talks a great deal. Scriptural glorification deals with the ultimate perfection of believers. Which is probably why we all think that this happens only when we get to go be with the Lord one day. We're all a work in progress. We've talked about that. The New Testament considerably makes it explicit that believers will be glorified. It says so in Romans 8, 2 Thessalonians. I could name a bunch of different places. But what God is saying here and what Paul is writing in, through God's encouragement is that those who God predestined, those who would accept his gift, those who were called and justified, they received the glory. The glory of the Lord shines through them. Despite the fact that this verse, it isn't just something to be hoped for. It isn't just something that will be revealed 
in the last day. It isn't just something to be obtained. It's something that God does through us. I read this quote by John Piper. He said, The task of all Christian scholarship, not just biblical studies, is to study reality as a manifestation of God's glory. To understand what the Scriptures are teaching us is a manifestation of God's glory. A sinner coming to follow the Lord, coming to accept forgiveness, coming to accept the gift of grace that God gives is a manifestation of God's glory. He goes on, he says, to speak about it, to write about it with accuracy and to savor the beauty of God in it and to make it serve the good of man. It's an abdication or a mistake of scholarship when Christians do academic work, though, with little reference to God. If all the universe and everything in it exists by the design of an infinite personal God to make his manifold glory known and loved, then to treat any subject without reference to God's glory isn't scholarship. It's insurrection. It's rebellion. When we love others to love Christ, that is allowing God's glory to flow through us. When we share with someone in the grocery store checkout line their beautiful outfit, their nice smile, whatever it may be, that's God's glory shining through you because you have no other reason to say so other than to allow God to shine through us. To, to, to shine through us. So the question we have, God has given us this system, this understanding that he predestined us, all of us. God called us, come. And we accepted that gift of grace. We have been justified. We now must allow God to be glorified with the way that we live our lives. It's a reaction to what God has already done. What are we really living for? It's crucial to realize that either our lives are glorifying God or we glorify something else or someone else. We always make something look big. Is it our loving God? If we don't glorify God when we're involved in a conflict, we inevitably show that someone else or something else rules our hearts. So what's it going to be? Church, what's it going to be? Are we going to be the kind of church that says, Lord, well, I don't know what the future is. I don't know what holds for the year to come. But I am so grateful that it's not up to me, but it's up to you. We talked about this yesterday with the officers. And I pray for us daily, Lord, help us get out of the way that you may be glorified by what we do. Let's do that. Let's be that kind of place. We all know places we don't want to hang out. Let's be the kind of place where people say, you know, I love those guys. I love the way Don smiles when he talks to me. I love the way Anne smiles when she thinks about her Lord. I love the way Bill wraps his arms around a friend and says, good to see you. I could go on and on and call you all out by name. I love the way Wendy prepares a meal that we all might be loved, right? We can go on and on and we can understand the love that we experience through our friends. But let's understand that it's because God first loved that that glory might be experienced by us all. Let's be that place to people that don't know us, to people that have never been here before. Because that's how God is. Let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you so much for this time that you spend with us. We thank you so much for helping us to understand as complicated as we make some things. 
that you help us to understand that we don't have to do the heavy lifting. You've already done that. You've already prepared a way for us. Help us, Lord, to focus on that, to focus on the love that you first gave us, to focus on the fact that we are your glory when you shine through us. Lord, we love you, and we go from this place excited to serve you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.